So how do you know if you're masking or not? Let's talk about it. If you're watching this and you're a person who is on the journey of discovering your neurodivergency or your autism, you may find yourself wondering whether or not you're a person who even masks, what your masks look like, and what aspects of yourself that may be considered a mask. This question is a lot more normal than you may think it is. I want to get that out there and give you guys some comfort. You're not the only person wondering this. This is probably one of the most important questions that we begin to ask ourselves when we are starting this journey. And on a lot of the online autism forums that I'm on, this is one of the most common questions I see being asked as well. This is something I wondered myself when I was starting my journey of discovering my autism. A lot of people who who may not be autistic or may not be neurodivergent may be wondering, how do you not know you're masking? It seems like something that you should know because masking requires you to be thinking about what to do within these masks, how to mask, all that stuff, right? A lot of people have this misconception that masking is a conscious choice that we make and are actively feeding into. And this is why it's a very nuanced topic. But if there's one thing we should really understand about why a lot of people out there may not even know that they're masking is because a lot of behaviors are unconscious. If not, most behavior patterns are subconscious. And let's kind of break that down a little bit before we talk more about masking. Behavior patterns, things like that, things that we do, a lot of the times, especially when you're already a full-blown adult, are subconscious because you spent a lifetime establishing these behavior patterns, right? And so you get to a point where in order to react a certain way, in order to do certain things, even though it requires not only your physical energy, but your mental energy as well, it might be so ingrained in who you are that you may not even process it as as masking because you process it as just your unique way of thinking. It's just who I am. That's why it's important for us to begin talking about the concept of what masking is so that you can begin to inject a little bit more awareness into yourself so that the next time you react a certain way or you have certain habits come up, you can be able to take a pause and be like, wait, this one thing that I usually do in certain moments like this is actually me masking. You could start to see those patterns for what it is and begin to understand what your masks are and why you may be masking in certain situations. And this is why discovering your autism as an adult is such a profound experience because at this point, when you are a late diagnosed person like me, you've spent a lifetime establishing yourself as a person, right? I'm sure you guys can write a list of your personality quirks. But when you learn about the neurodivergency, you can begin to understand what aspects of your personality is attributed to autism or ADHD or both of them. So when I like to think about masking and when I like to explain masking to other people, I like to break it down into two different categories. There is masking and there is also scripting. These both go hand in hand. A lot of the times you can't have one without having the other. I am currently creating a workbook just for this topic of learning about what your masks are and uncovering your masks. So if that's something that you are interested in, click through the link in my description box to my Etsy shop and you could just for five dollars download this workbook for yourself. The goal of my channel is not only to make learning about your autism something that is accessible but also something that is affordable because not everyone has access to getting the help that they may need. It's just a part of my mission plan to make these types of workbooks and videos accessible to you guys. It's also about the honor system, you know, I talk about this in so much detail in these videos so technically you could work work through these on your own for free. But by going to my Etsy shop and paying that $5 to download the actual product, it's a really great way to support a small channel like me. I put so much time, heart, and energy and thought into being able to make these types of workbooks. And this is something that I'm super passionate about. So, you know, being able to actually like buy my product and support me and what I do is a really great way to just give back to me as I give back to you as we 
we give back to the community and the cycle goes on. There are some precursor questions that I have written down that we should be asking ourselves. This is where we can begin to warm ourselves up into this type of topic. So as I ask these questions, I want you guys to answer back to me out loud with a mm-hmm or a mm-mm. The reason why I want this to happen is because I want you guys to not have to think too much about it and just give your immediate gut instinct answer. Are you guys ready? Do I feel uncomfortable in social situations? Do I feel drained after social situations? Do I avoid social situations? Do I need time to recoup after social situations? Do I need to know who will be at social situations? Do I need to know where the social situation will be? Do I need to know what we will be doing at social situations? Do I analyze how I was acting and talking during or after a social interaction? Do I dread social interaction despite how pleasant I come across on the surface and despite how much I am actually enjoying myself during the social interaction? And the last question is, would I act or talk like this if I was alone? These are very important questions that I think you guys should begin to think about when it comes to whether or not you may or may not be masking. The more you say "Mm mm-hmm to these questions, I feel like it is a high possibility that you are masking. Situations that you may be masking is in family situations, interactions with friends, interactions within work, interactions within your hobby, interactions within your relationships, and interactions with strangers. So these are all social interactions that may require you to mask and to script. And so when we begin to think about what our masks may be, what they may look like, it's important to know which masks you use and rely on in these different social situations. Because how you mask with family may be different with how you mask with friends. And how you mask with friends may be different with how you mask with work and how you mask within work may be different with how you mask within romantic relationships. I find a lot of the times with autistic individuals or neurodivergent people in general, our different masks are tailored towards different group dynamics, especially for autistic individuals because we're catering those masks to certain individuals we're interacting with in order to make the social interaction more smooth. And I wanna take this time to also emphasize that masking is not just something neurodivergent people do. It's not something just autistic people do. Everyone can mask, even neurotypical and holistic people. So I don't want people to think that just cause you do mask, you cannot be neurotypical or holistic. And likewise, I don't want you guys to think that if you see a neurotypical or holistic person masking, they now could be a neurodivergent person. You know, that's kind of like the complexity of all this is that these are behavior patterns and different ways to process things. And it's not something that is just exclusive to neurodivergency. And in that sense, it's important for you to keep educating yourself on neurodivergency. It's usually a plethora of symptoms coexisting with each other. And so in that sense, neurotypical people can have attributes of neurodivergency here and there, but if it's not all these symptoms coexisting together that spans across their whole life, that is kind of what determines whether or not you are a neurodivergent person versus a neurotypical person, right? Because neurotypical people can utilize masking in situations where they're not necessarily feeling the most natural or they have to be more cognizant of their behaviors. So for example, I would say most people would mask to a certain capacity in work situations because you have to have a certain facade and professionalism at work. So now we could begin to dive in deeper into the levels of masking. I break these down into different categories, authentic versus inauthentic. So how true to myself can I be? Sometimes we may have the misconception that masking means that we're not being ourselves. A lot of the times masks are actually authentic to ourselves. It's just you're tailoring yourself to respond a certain way, look a certain way, but that could actually be an authentic version of yourself. Yourself. So just because you're masking, it doesn't mean you're faking to be another person. It's just the utilization of different types of masks. 
The next thing is open versus judged. So can I be open and honest or do I feel judged? This will affect your levels of masking because whether or not you feel open with the other person or within the situation can kind of determine the type of masks that you are using and the levels of masks that you are using in that situation. If you imagine you're in an environment where you feel judged or around a person that you feel judged by, your masks are going to feel a little bit more inauthentic and the level of masking may be higher because you are tailoring yourself more to the other person in order to not be judged. The next thing is new versus history. So is this person new or do we have history? This will also affect your level of masking for many different reasons that is special and unique to you. Everyone is going to be different. I personally find that I tend to mask more when I meet new people and I'm not necessarily used to them, but I actually do begin to mask in a more uncomfortable way when I start to get to know someone and build history with them. And I feel like the reason why I do this is because when I establish history with someone, there's a lot of complex social dynamics there that I have to maintain with this person and I know them a lot more and so I feel like in a sense, the masking with people I have history with is actually more uncomfortable to me because it's more details within this mask that I have to uphold that becomes tiring to me over time. Just because you are comfortable with someone or just because you've known someone for a long time or been somewhere for a long time, that automatically means you don't mask anymore. That's not necessarily the case. And the next thing is stable versus sensitive. So is this person stable or sensitive? This this also affects the levels at which you mask because if someone tends to be a more sensitive person, that might make you need to mask more in front of them and script more in front of them because you have to kind of be more cognizant of how they feel and how you're affecting them. You have to kind of manage what you look like, what you say, how you come across to them a little bit more carefully. I noticed that for myself, when someone is more sensitive, I have to mask and script a lot more. And when someone is generally more stable and don't take things too personally, I could kind of feel more free to be myself and say what I actually want to say. Masking is not necessarily a bad thing. I do think, like I always say in all my videos, it's all about balance, right? When you have too much of something, it's not good. Usually a lot of things in life are neutral things, but when it becomes unbalanced, that that's when it becomes a negative. Masking for the most part because it's utilized in so many situations in which you don't necessarily want to mask and it becomes a draining thing, it's seen as a negative experience. But masking could also be very positive when you use it to express authentic parts of yourself in order for another person to understand who you truly are more accurately. If you utilize masking to your advantage, it could be very, very empowering. I think what it comes down to is whether or not it feels like a choice to you. Are you choosing to mask or do you feel forced into doing so? When it comes to figuring out your comfort levels with masking, I want you guys to think about effort versus success the effort you're putting into your masking and how much you're succeeding at that social situation. Masking can affect your energy levels in different ways. It can make you feel fulfilled and energized at its best. It could also burn you out when it's becoming unbalanced and at its worst, it can even lead to meltdowns. And so I want to go into explaining the six different scenarios in which I find people masking the most and in which category does that specific mask fit into the fulfilled and energized category, the burnout category or the meltdown category. So the first scenario is the best scenario. This is the type that will make you feel fulfilled and energized, right? It's a mask that feels natural to you because it's authentic. You're also in a scenario in which you feel open and comfortable. So this requires minimal effort on your part, but the success is exponential. This is the best case scenario, right? Because you can mask have successful interactions, feel great about it, feel fulfilled, and not feel drained afterwards. 
Now we're gonna begin to ramp up the discomfort levels and these are the types of masks and interactions that may lead to burnouts. This is a scenario in which you feel nervous for the interaction leading into it. This is usually when you have to be very cognizant of your scripts and your masks, but once you're in the interaction, the nerves begin to dissipate and the interaction is successful. So this is where you feel like somewhat of a discomfort there. It's not horrible yet. If you were to ramp up the discomfort a little bit more, it would be a situation where you feel nervous before the interaction, and you may even feel anxious and uncomfortable during the interaction, but you could at least feel proud of the fact that the interaction was successful. The thing about these is it's not horrible, but if you have these types of interactions too much, it could lead to burnout because you feel very tired and drained afterwards, even though you do have successful relationships and interactions. So if we were to ramp up the discomfort levels more, these can maybe lead to burnouts or meltdowns. So an interaction where you have nerves leading into the interaction and you're not even enjoying the interaction. Ramping it up even more, you're dreading a social interaction, but you have to do it because it is necessary and unavoidable. As you can see, the discomfort level is ramping up because you don't feel like you have a choice to say no to these interactions. There's a level of forcing yourself, right? The reasons why this is in the category of leading to meltdowns is because you're not only feeling exhausted, by masking within these interactions, but you're not getting any sort of energy being fed back into you. There's no fulfillment coming from it, right? The worst case scenario is you're dreading an interaction, you're forced to go through it, it's not even a successful interaction and it doesn't go well. This is a situation in which you didn't want to be in that interaction to begin with and once you're in it, you find yourself misinterpreting the other person, you find the other person misinterpreting you, and maybe even accusing you and attacking you. These are interactions that are very draining, distressing, and therefore can lead to meltdowns. It's just not enjoyable all around. It's not a successful interaction. It honestly just like hurts you. But other than that, stick around and watch the video I made where I help you guys uncover your stems. See you guys on next week's video. Bye guys.